actually get to that discussion where we'll be together with each other to talk through those things. And while I'm putting those in the chat, I'm going to pass the mic to my co-host Vinny to introduce himself. All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks, JP. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is very exciting. First one of 2021. JP kind of said most of what was on my heart there, but uh, you know, just a little bit about myself. Uh, in addition to working with my own words, I work with a lot of other people's words. I work in publishing here in Portland. So uh, my life is very much filled with writers. Uh, and, and I couldn't help but say yes. Uh, that was not a very good sentence, but I couldn't help but say yes when the case asked about continuing this because uh, even though we live in a city that is a very open city and you know most reading series and most events are very inclusive and are always going to include a queer queer readers and queer writers uh it's nice to have something that's just our own and there's nothing like going into a space and not having to think about how do i explain myself to half an audience that might not understand me at the level of my dna you know <laughs> sort of uh, and so um, that's part of the reason why i i just am very excited to help continue this I think very important um, reading series. So um, JP already asked for those of you who put your uh, put your names in if you're out of town, but I did want to take a moment just to uh, acknowledge that we have people visiting from, uh, visiting, I guess, <laughs> joining us from out of town. And despite all of the garbage that we've gone through this last year, I, I'm a big uh, fan of finding silver linings. And one of the biggest silver linings of going virtual is now people can attend who couldn't physically attend in the past. So I just want to say a huge shout out to those of you who are joining us uh, for the first time or joining us from out of town who couldn't in the past. So we're happy to have you here in this virtual space. But, uh, but I think I've done enough talking. I want to get one of our readers up here. <laughs> and so uh, I'm going to kick off and, and uh, introduce our first reader. Uh, and our first reader of the night is Claire Rudy Foster. Uh, hey, Foster, over there. Um, so, Claire Rudy Foster, he, they, uh, is an award-winning writer and the author of the critically acclaimed short story collection, Shine of the Ever, which was selected by O, the Oprah magazine, yeah, that one, uh, as one of the best books of the year. Foster's writing appears on NPR, in the Modern Love column, in New York Times, the Washington Post, McSweeney's, and many other places. And Foster lives right here in Portland. So, welcome, Foster. Thank you so much. Yay, us. Thank you, Vinny. Thank you, JP. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and Literary Arts, it's really nice to be here. And it's so nice to see my friends' names and faces in the chat. Like, hi, guys. Thank you for coming uh, tonight because our focus is on queer spaces and um, queer voices and the subject of the relief. I wanted to read a flash piece from my collection, Shine at the Ever which you can purchase at another read-through or another indie bookstore of your choice. Uh, this piece is called Cat Sitting. I knew I liked Kim when she said hi at the AA meeting, complimented my crop top and told me I reminded her of Debbie Harry. Her exact words were, Debbie Harry, if Debbie was played by Michelle Pfeiffer, by the way, I'm Kim and I have cancer. Who wouldn't want to be friends after that? Kim was straight, but I didn't hold that against her. Something about coping with her own mortality gave her dimension, kindness, intuition. They're the qualities I associate with people of my type, not hers. Most straight people are so clueless. They ask such stupid questions. What's it like being gay? They watch porn actors fucking each other in same-sex couplings and they think it's an anatomical thing. The way I feel and am, nubs and fists and getting married and making babies. <laughs> That's their normal. It's exhausting. What's it like? <laughs> you tell me. Kim said chemo was exhausting. She missed her long hair and hated explaining to people that she looked okay because she had a rare neck cancer, not the usual kind, but in reality, I don't think she had anything to complain about. Who wouldn't want her life? I did, cancer or no cancer. I told myself that hers was the life I should be living. It was like one long Instagram story. Kim was a designer. She drove a black BMW. 
she traveled too much for work. And I was part-time at the Audubon Society. So we figured something out. When she was gone, I was supposed to collect the mail, feed the cat and make it look as if someone was home. It was convenient for her. And since I was sober, she figured she could trust me. It was an easy job and her cat was the best cat, Biggie was a massive white furball with crossed blue eyes, a sweet little bitch, even if all cats are heartless murdering bird killers. Not that I have a resentment, they can't help the way they are. My girlfriend dumped me the morning that Kim left for Brazil. I don't really wanna dwell on the breakup, but I was eager to get away. I treated Kim's house as though it was mine. I wasn't stealing. Well, yes, I was, but she always left a note that said, help yourself. And I chose to interpret that in a way that suited me. Why shouldn't I enjoy it while I could? I deserved it anyway. My feelings were hurt. Kim's blender was rad in part because she couldn't eat or swallow, but also because she could afford the best one. I made myself an organic blueberry and almond milk smoothie that tasted as if it came from a field of wild native fruit bushes. The blender did something to bring out the honey in it and the sunshine. Rich people really do have it better. So do their cats. Biggie pooped in a special odor-proof box in the laundry room. She ate better than I did. All of Kim's stuff was high-tech. Even her supplements were spray vitamins pumpkin oil and cherry flavored B12 and omega-6 blend and St. John's wort and belladonna and THC and CBD and two kinds of prescription anti-anxiety drugs and some kind of liquid cocaine were all lined up like perfume samples. I totally didn't mean to relapse. <laughs> but I did two squirts from every bottle and then I lay down on the bed. When I woke up and went back into the bathroom to hit the vitamins again, I saw that I had eyeliner all over my cheek, the same inky black as Kim's phenomenally fancy sheets. I lay on the bed spraying vitamins into my mouth and alternately crying about my breakup and fantasizing about getting revenge on my ex. Biggie sat next to my head she wasn't allowed in the bedroom because of Kim's immune system, but I always ignored that and just let the air filter running and the windows open. I wasn't worried about cat dander at all. The filter was super efficient. Stains, on the other hand, were a different story. I was making another smoothie when Biggie went out through the cat door and came back with a meadow lark in her mouth. It was still alive, which I didn't realize until Biggie let go of it. She brought me a present. I looked at her and she meowed. What are you thinking? I asked her. And that's how I knew I was super fucking high because who wonders what a cat has on its mind? I realized I still had the bottle of B12 in my hand. My pee was going to be really really orange. Biggie's pupils were huge and mine probably were too. She was high on the bird's suffering. She wasn't going to kill it yet. She saved its death for me. The meadowlark fluttered around as though beating itself against the fireplace or Kim's hi-fi would somehow change its situation. Biggie pounced on it again and let it go, chasing it over the linen sofas and across the buffalo hide rug. She clawed loose pawfuls of quills, feathers with veins, contour and flight feathers, down, phyloplume, semi-plume, and bristle. They pooled in the corners of the living room and under the shelves and cases. The meadow lark flapped into the wall and then through the door to the place where I'd been sleeping. I followed. A songbird couldn't hurt me. At work, I helped reset the broken wing of a great horned owl and its beak was like garden shears. It could have punctured the meat of my hands without even trying. Humans are so soft, just buttery animals with thin hides and flat little teeth, no claws. 
We have no natural defenses. We're just fucking mean to each other. When you're high, don't call anyone, especially not your friend who has cancer. I sat on the edge of the bed and stared at the bird. It was nearly wingless now. Biggie lay down at my feet and we watched the bird make Rorschach blotches on the wall. Hell yes, I was going to just leave it there. Aren't we just 50 kinds of awful, I said. She purred. Thank you for listening. Again, that was cat sitting from Shine of the Ever. Thank you so much, Foster. Um, it's great to have you here and I appreciated that. Um, I'm still thinking about how humans are so soft. We are. <laughs> Um, our next reader is Samson Sieroth. Samson is an actor, director, and writer focusing on visibility of Asian American artists and underserved communities. Uh, Samson received a BA from the University of Arkansas, Fort Smith, and then trained at the Portland Actors Conservatory. He was part of the Theater Communication Group's Rising Leaders of Color Cohort in 2017, featured by American Theater Magazine, and was the recipient of the Portland Civic Theater Guild's Leslie O. Fulton Fellowship that same year. He's the Managing Artistic Director of Theater Diaspora and part of the PDX Accountability Collective. And if you want to learn more about him, uh, his website is gettingloud.com. Samson, it's great to have you here. Hi, JP. Thanks so much. Um, I just have three little pieces. The first is from a the, the play I'm currently working on called A Queer Engagement. Um, it's about two queer men and their relationships with their mother, mothers. Um, and this monologue is the mother of the Asian man talking to her son's lover. When I was pregnant with him, my mother-in-law gave me hell, even though I was carrying her grandson. But I persisted. This tiny human growing inside me meant the world to me. That's why we came to America. I just want the best for my son because, well, he's my son. I remember his first Halloween. He dressed up as Superman of all things and said, Mommy, look, I'm Superman. He had a smile bigger than his face could contain. I was so consumed with his happiness that I hadn't realized he had crawled up on the coffee table. I can fly, were the words I heard as time moved in slow motion. As fast as I could move, as hard as I tried, I could not reach him in time. I couldn't save him from himself. Not in that moment. And although he's a full grown adult now, he, he's still my baby boy trying to fly. You don't understand. How could you possibly know what it's like creating a person, guiding him, feeding him just to let them go? But listen, I know that you love my son and I know you would do anything for him. I can rest easy knowing he has you. And I have a little bit of poetry I'd like to share as well. And I, I also got a new dog. She's a little loud and whiny, but um, I hope you bear with me. <laughs> this piece is called Hello Mother. I wake up to the... I wake up to the soft glow of an iPhone. Text message. Mom is in the hospital. She tested positive. My mind is like a crowded room filled with thoughts rushing towards the only escape door. My thumbs create a rushed hum, a tempo faster than any song I've heard. Tapping on the screen, Morse code sending an SOS to anyone and everyone. I bring the phone to my ear. My father's voice is isolated. She was admitted alone, knowing little English, no translator. 
My mom does not answer the phone. Seven times I've tried in the past 30 minutes. The ringtones are harsh, like sandpaper on my eardrums. The silence in between are filled with white noise, a silent scream of pain of the unknown. A click, the gentle sound of a pained hello. Now I can breathe again. And this last piece is called Secret Magic. I knew there was magic when water fell from the sky out of thin air. I stand dry and parched when a tiny translucent, translucent pebble burst on my skin. For a moment, I thought I had imagined it. The first raindrop I had experienced. Rain. It came over me slowly, sneaking like a predator. After it drenched me with saliva, I heard its thunderous roar. And no one noticed. My mother opened a barrier to shield herself. I will have none of that. I run to an open area and lifted my head. I embraced it with my face. Liquid of life. Rain. I welcomed this impromptu bath, which was way too cold. It tickled my neck as it soaked my clothing. My open mouth smile at the rain mixed with my spit. I twirled like no one's business, like it was up to me to keep the planet rotating. My arms outstretched to catch the limitless water. My coat projected the water in a circle around me. And then I saw it a collection of rain on the ground, a puddle. I was equipped with boots to explore this tiny ocean. I ran without hesitation and leaped into the air. My target was shimmering, vibrating, growing. My sudden force created a small tsunami, my power incarnate, rain. People say it's science, it can be explained, but that does not make it any less miraculous. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Samson, that was beautiful. So I'm gonna, you hung up on uh, ringtones like sandpaper for a while, that one, <laughs> that one hit me right there, so that was good. Um, so, well, uh, Wow. Um, so our next reader that we're going to bring up uh, as one that I'm excited to hear. I've not had the pleasure uh, yet. So, um, but let's welcome Sarah. So uh, Sarah H. Chavez, a Mestina born and raised in the California Century Valley. I like that. My, my people too. Uh, is the author of the poetry collections, Hands That Break and Scar from Sundress Publications and All Day Talking, Dancing Girl Press. Her new project, Half-Breed Helena Navigates the Whole, received a 2019-2020 Tacoma Art Artist Initiative Award. Um, Chavez serves as poetry coordinator for Best of the Net Anthology and is a member of the Macondo Writers Workshop. Recent work can be found in Chicanics, Mexican-American Writers of the 21st Century, Diode, and Hotel America. That's a lot. Awesome. <laughs> Our micro chap, like everything else we loved, is forthcoming from Pork Belly Press in 2021. So let's give Sarah a big welcome. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you for introducing me, Benny. And thank you, uh, Jennifer, for inviting me um, and Literary Arts for putting this together. Um, I'm very excited to be here. It's such a cool reading. Um, so I brought three poems, um, two from the new project. I was gonna read, um, I thought about reading, I have another like full length manuscript that I've been working on for a while um, that are epistles. Um, but I realized like there's almost, I couldn't spin relief in any way <laughs> that I looked at these poems. So um, I was like, all right, I'm just gonna like, try to like lean into the theme as best I can, so. We'll see. Um, but I ended up also picking, um, so the first one is actually a much older poem. Um, 
And it's from a series that I had started that was re-envisioning the myth, uh, the North American indigenous myth of the turtle who carried the world. Um, and in it, the turtle, turtle, that's um, their name, is the is a main character and has agency and uh, ends up there's that sort of world before humans and then humans um, are invented turtle has to carry the earth and then eventually gets to come back and so this first this first poem is turtle getting to come back like in the 21st century and being like pretty sad about the state the earth is in Turtle rejects depression. Because there are stretches of turtle's life before carrying the earth that ring loudly in an absence so dark it rivals the moment preceding the birth of stars, he tries to bring quiet through remembering the natural world. Willing himself to think not a feline, but rather to picture similarities between the land before there was earth and what is now earth. Turtle recalls there were many leaves, so many leaves raining around the shore near the grove in which he once sat, completely at ease. They would lift his head as far back as it could go and put out a small pink tongue to catch fresh autumn. It tasted like fire, Turtle thought, like the sun and wind and death. Turtle stops thinking. That might be too sad and he fears the dark ringing might understand such melancholy as an invitation back. But that is not sad, Turtle insists. Death should never be sad. That is only the selfishness of humans mythology creeping into my brain. Death is never one's ending. Rather, it is the beginning of true connection. In which case, the copper leaves in his memory drifting down the slope of his shell tastes like promise. And each crinkle and disintegration of leaf particles is absorption, adjoining to soil joining water, joining turtle. Yes, thanks. Feeling the soles of the leaves slipping beneath his teeth. And these next two um, are half-breed Helene poems. Um, it's a series um, I've been working on. Uh, oh, this one's here, sorry, I saw. Um, that uh, they're all about a kind of primary character. It's not quite a, like a Consul Roman, but like someone who's sort of trying to come into uh, just a sense of themselves, um, a queer half Mexican, half white uh, working class person who's just trying to feel belonging in any way. Um, and uh, the poems kind of ended up getting a little bit sidetracked as um, the pandemic continued. Uh, so these are two of the most recent ones. Um, so, Half-Breed Helene goes outside to cry. The pressure that wells in her throat threatens to choke, but this is not the time. This is never the time. She nods, even though the voice that whispers incomprehensible words is on the phone. When gone and this morning and I didn't want to tell you and no, you don't need to fly back yet, register. The walls of her rented room begin to close. What hours earlier was spacious and airy, sunlight like an afternoon aura has become tight invisibly pressing her ribs. It's hard to move toward the door. Her legs so unsteady, she stumbles, bruising a shoulder on the jam. The entrance to the yard is just off the hallway, rickety, rotting wood porch, soft beneath her feet. She sits on the steps, presses her head between her knees and tries to breathe. The voice 
on the other end says something resembling a leaving. H waits until there is a click, like the way phones used to signal disconnection. When everything is silent, save the cacophony of birds singing in the eucalyptus and cedar elm that ring the yard, Helene crawls over, eyelashes glued and glowing to a bare patch in the grass, digs her fingers into the dirt, making what resembles the bite from a large and ravenous animal. She tilts her head toward the hollow, ready to release whatever might fall from her face. And then this is the last one. Half-breed Helene tries to write a letter to her future self. Dear to whom it may concern, I suppose there's no telling what the world is like. Whether there really was a vaccine, whether student loans were forgiven, if the world didn't explode in a macho show of dick swinging and nationalism. Through yesterday, oh, is everything more divided? Teresa asked in bed last night, an idea suggested through yesterday's looking at the self-segregated tables on our full sections, that maybe the US will break into a thousand cultural caucuses or like that 180s movie in a post-apocalyptic Mad Max X Chicago or San Francisco where there are white street gangs and black street gangs and lady gangs and queer gangs and Latinx gangs. She asks me, which gang would you choose? It was a fair question, but one with an overly easy answer because it's the answer H gets every day in 30 acts of micro exclusions. Whoever will let me stay? I shrug. We shrug a lot now. What about in your now? I guess it's even arrogant to think you have a now, but there is a now this letter has miraculously reached. Our now now is so tenuous, fraught. I know most people say it gets better, but that's only for the folks with the public platform to tell us that. All those other fools just withered in lonesome obscurity or and died. If you are alive, I hope we aren't an asshole. I can feel it creep in sometimes, the hard hardening around that which is already scared and impenetrable. Like kindnesses glance off the outside unfelt and only later acknowledged intellectually. I barely thank Teresa for that cup of black coffee she had waiting for me on the morning shift she knew I didn't want to take. It wasn't until two days later I realized my sweet friend was trying to tell me they had a crush on me or that I realized in that call from my dad, he was asking if I was okay, just to actually know if I was okay. I guess it's just as well. I wouldn't have known how to answer them. Here's an important question. Are you able to afford those holiday shaped sugar cookies from Starbucks? I fucking love those. It's such low key torture watching all of the trust fund hipsters sneaking out of the Starbucks next door to the restaurant, John Deere's pulled low cradling lattes and heart-shaped cookies and egg-shaped and pumpkin. The snowman is my favorite. Is it still our favorite? I guess because I've never seen the snow. Have you seen the snow? How big are the flakes? Does it sting when they land on your skin? Respectfully you, H. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. It's so good to hear your voice and to hear all the voices in those poems. Um, and I feel like there's no better wish for, for my future self than to just keep saying, I hope we aren't an asshole. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here and for reading. Um, the last reader tonight is Wayne Gregory. Uh, Wayne is the author of The Tongues of Men and Angels, which is a memoir about growing up gay in the religious world of the 1970s South. He's also a contributor to the anthology Fashionably Late, and his work has also appeared in The Sun, Altopia, Ash Journal, The Hawthorne, and the Lambda award-winning anthology Portland Queer. 
He's taught at Willamette University and Portland State University and is currently an adjunct teaching fellow at the Attic Institute and a freelance writer. He's a linguist, a proud grandfather, and a member of the Portland Gay Men's Chorus. Welcome, Wayne. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, to share with you and to be part of this this event. It's really I've enjoyed so much already uh, what people have shared. So I'm I'm going to share a, a little excerpt from the uh, memoir that you mentioned um, uh, called Bridges. And this is a point at which I was still in the closet or but in the process of coming out uh, very in a very difficult way for me. And um, this is a, a section where uh, my former wife, when I was uh, married, uh, Terry and I are uh, going to this event. Um, and I, I think she's actually, Terry, Terry and I have maintained a really good friendship over the years since this. And uh, I think she's joined us tonight. So she's out there in the audience somewhere. But anyway, I want to share this with you and uh, I appreciate the opportunity very much. It's a, a chapter called Bridges. One night I was sitting at my computer in my study. Terry shoved a brochure at me. I read the cover, Evangelicals Concerned creating safe places for LGBT Christians. Terry leaned against the doorway. They're having their conference in Portland. I think it might be good for us. I laid the brochure on my desk. I don't want anything to do with evangelicals anymore. That part of me is long gone. She shifted from one leg to the other. I don't care about the evangelical part either, but there are couples who've been through what we're going through. Some of them will be there to tell their stories. I flipped through the brochure again. On the back, I saw that Christian singer-songwriter Cynthia Clausen was going to do a concert the last night of the conference. I couldn't believe it. Look at this, Cynthia Clausen. I held up the brochure for Terry to see. I know, she nodded. I really didn't want to get mixed up again in that world I'd buried but I disappointed her so much for so long. I didn't want to do that anymore either. Okay, I guess you can sign us up, I said. She smiled. Maybe things aren't the same as they were before. You've been out of that world for a long time. I shrugged, yeah, maybe she's right. What could it hurt? We drove across the Ross Island Bridge, then took the 99E Milwaukee exit. The late afternoon July sky felt soft and lazy, like a baby blue blanket draped over my shoulders. The air blew cool through the car windows with just the trace of the heat from earlier in the day riding underneath it. I'd come to realize that Portland had been my place to escape from the facade and explore the real gay boy inside. I would cross over from my world of manufactured straightness onto a shore where the hidden expressions of who I was could flourish. I wanted to believe these indulgences were counter to who I really was or wanted to be, but the fog and shame, the fog of shame and guilt I lived in kept me from seeing that in these moments of seeming darkness, I was actually closest to finding the light and clarity of being my true self. After parking at Reed College, I sat for a moment and held the keys in my hand, put them back in the ignition, took them out again. Come on, we're gonna be late. Terry got out of the car and slammed the door. With some energy I couldn't claim as my own, I got out and meandered toward the chapel in Elliott Hall where the concert was to take place in a matter of minutes. We entered the empty echoing corridors and made our way to the foot of the stairwell that led to the second floor chapel not another soul in sight. As we reached, reached the foot of the stairs, I looked up and saw a woman standing erect, dressed in a flowing white dress that reached the floor with a mass of bright red head, hair falling down her back, hands folded as if in prayer. I froze the way fearful mortals of the Bible did in the presence of the angelic messengers of God. I love you, Lord. She began to sing the familiar church chorus, her strong, rich notes ringing through the open chamber above me. And I lift my voice. I closed my eyes and tried to remember what it felt like 
to have the music of grace swirl around me. Worship you, oh my soul. Her voice began to fade as she processed out of the foyer above me and into the small chapel. We quickly climbed the stairs to follow the music and reached the open door of the tap chapel just as Cynthia sat down at her piano and began to accompany herself on the song. She asked the congregation to join her. I stood motionless and hesitant at the open doorway. The long, dark wooden pews were filled with men and women, arms raised and eyes closed. There were a couple of empty aisle seats on the back pew. Terry went in first. I slipped quietly into place next to her. Although I knew the song by heart, I couldn't make my mouth move. So I watched and listened. The music of the congregation was unlike any I had ever heard. Strong, complex harmonies rose together to fill the rafters above. I could feel the sound vibrate its passion through my body. Cynthia stopped playing the piano and as the piano fell away, the song of the congregation seemed to crescendo and fill the room like the thick holy smoke of God in the Old Testament that I heard about so many times in Sunday school. Behind Cynthia, a set of open windows welcomed the filtered rays of afternoon sun that cast an ethereal glow around her. I felt myself growing weak, almost lightheaded. Then, as if someone in the rafters had reached down and grabbed my hands, I felt my arms being pulled upward and a warm tingling around my lips as soft mumbling words begin to trickle out. I love you, Lord. I whispered the melody and slowly closed my eyes. And I lift my voice. The music grew quicker around me and suddenly I felt grace, mercy, forgiveness dancing close to me, lightly kissing my cheeks, brushing past my lips, surrounding me with their strange tongues and their warm touch. Cynthia transposed into another song, a familiar call. Without a break, the congregation followed her and their collective voices soared. Then, gently, a breeze began to blow through the open windows on one side of the chapel. Cool summer wind flooded the holy place. A rushing mighty wind that rattled through the room and fell on me like a new Pentecost. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. The words of the prophet Joel suddenly filled my mind. For the first time, I felt grace, mercy, and forgiveness embrace me like that they might never let me go. Here I was, singing to God with a room full of queers, embraced by the God I thought I was forever hidden from, behind a wall of my own shame and self-loathing. As the song reached its final verse, I fell back in the pew and released a long breath. It seemed that some kind of energy had left my body. I knew at that moment that there was nothing more to lose. The struggle was over and I was finally free to be me. I opened my eyes and looked at the men and women around me singing their love songs to God. I looked at Terry, her eyes closed, her arms raised, her face pushed toward heaven. She looked like she did the first time we stood together like this on our first date at a Christian concert 25 years earlier. I didn't know what lay ahead for us then, and I didn't know what, was going, what it was going to mean for me now to live my life as an openly gay man. But I knew that for the first time in my life, I felt a sense of congruence and peace. I felt closer to being me. I felt, well, relief. After almost 50 years, I knew I had crossed over to another shore. And here, in the fading July light, I began to dream my dreams of other bridges to cross and new shores I might now be free to walk. Thank you.
Thank you, Lane. Thank you for bringing that that song into our space tonight too. Um, that was really lovely. Um, I just want to thank again all of our readers uh, for sharing their work with us tonight. We're about to move into the second portion of our event, which is our community discussion. Um, so for that, we're going to move into small groups to have a chance to meet some of the other people who are here tonight and to talk about our theme of relief. I'm going to pop the questions for that back into the chat um, so that everybody has them handy. And we'll be in these smaller groups for about 10 minutes or so, um, just kind of they're very casual, a chance to get to know each other. And then we'll come back together and kind of share out some of the things that we've talked about. So I hope you enjoy meeting and talking with each other and we'll see you back here in about 10 minutes. Hi, we're in, we're in a group. <laughs> oh, I wasn't sure if I had joined one or not. So I was like, I don't know what's happening. Uh oh, Elisa, can you see us? There we oh, go. There. Sorry. <laughs> I, <was muted. laughs> I saw like a little panic in your eyes and I wasn't oh, sure. <laughs> How are you? Oh, man. I'm a... Uh hanging in there. How are you? <laughs> Same. <laughs> Same. <laughs> can, you, can you hear us? Yes. Oh, great. Yeah, I was, I was on mute. Sorry. I, I realized I was on mute <laughs> like, uh, until just now. Yeah. Oh, you're all good. How are you? Uh, yeah. Like, uh, uh, so I'm actually a good friend of Wayne's and so I'm still uh, kind of reeling from yeah. the meeting, you know, yeah. that, was, that was really something. Yeah, it was great. I really loved that piece. Um, Jeff, I don't know if you can hear us or it's okay if you don't want to turn your camera on, but feel free to hop on. I don't know what the questions were. Does anyone? It says, um, what brings you relief? Oh, okay, okay. And how can, how can or do we bring relief to other people, both inside and outside of queer communities? I was thinking of relief totally differently. So I feel stymied by these questions right now. I was what thinking- were, What were you thinking? I was thinking about, um, well, I was thinking about how they chose the theme <laughs> probably before the election in the hopes of, of the, well, I guess I didn't choose it before the election, but assuming um, this turn, this, that it would go this way, but then how, how the relief that so many of us felt immediately after has, mm -hmm. <laughs> has probably soured a bit in the last, in the last week or so, if not before. Um, and, and what that can feel like, like the, the taking away of, of relief. <laughs> yeah. I agree with that. I feel like the relief was almost feels like short lived. <laughs> super short lived. <laughs> yeah, super short lived. Which is not what they wanted us to talk about, but that's where. Yeah, I guess it's hard to think about like relief as longer to longer term. I guess just now, I feel like it's like kind of on a day to day. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, yeah. also I was thinking that um, I just got prescribed a steroid for an allergic reaction that I've been having. And um, I, took, I took it about a half hour before we started and I'm not nearly as itchy. So that's relief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough question because like even when I think about, well, what brings me relief? It's usually like just in the moment, I've never thought of what will, you know, decidedly or like, you know, guaranteed bring me relief. And that's, I've never thought of that. And I actually have to think of that quite a, 
quite a bit. Um, I mean, how often is relief really sustained? <laughs> true, true. Um, yeah, I, I'm also thinking of that uh, of the second part of that question. How do, how do we bring relief to uh, the queer community and and outside? I I don't know, I actually kind of like stumped by that because um, it, I mean, like, did, have we ever experienced a sense of relief, you know, as, you know, as a community of uh, queer people? Like, I mean, yeah, certainly there've been like victories that have been like, you know, and they've been followed by, you know, more like regressive news and uh, things like that. But like, I don't, I don't know if, if it's ever, I've ever felt a sense of relief with anything that's happened in the last several years. Yes, a victory is 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 different, right? It's there's moments of of joy and happiness, like oh, we can get married or we're more safe. But is it ever complete relief? I don't know that it would is. Yeah, I feel like relief kind of suggests that there is a danger right? Like inherently, it's just like a break from the danger or like a break from something, <laughs> something yeah, threatening. Like, yeah. like, like genuine safety, mm -hmm. maybe, which I don't know that the community can feel. And any community right now, I mean, besides like this had white guys. It's getting depressing, guys. It's okay. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, okay. <laughs> it's not your fault. <laughs> Relief is supposed to be, I think, an uplifting topic, <laughs> a more hopeful topic. <laughs> I think their intention was was not to be a downer. <laughs> I think we could have used a couple more questions, I think. This was... Uh, <laughs> it got too, uh, what is it, like, deconstructed? <laughs> do we um like you know like get back together with uh, with everyone else or um, yeah i'm gonna close them it, okay so first time i'm attending it, it becomes a larger discussion after we come back yeah we kind of do like does anyone want to share something great that happened we'll just say we were confused and sad <laughs> <laughs> We weren't feeling relief, that's all. <laughs> oh, well, how do I? Okay, should I close them all now? Do you know how I was not keeping track? I did not even look at what time it was. It's I think, I, think... Like, I thought the event was seven to eight, wasn't it? Um, I think 8.30. Oh, okay. I um, kind of have to bail. I'm sorry. <laughs> like I, 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 <laughs> oh, I find that attending from seven to eight. So <laughs> I didn't realize it was seven to 8.30. Um, well, uh, are you going back to the main room now or, 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 yeah, I'm going to do that now. I, yeah, I'll just close all rooms and then you'll see everyone pop up again. Okay. Okay. Everyone has been giving a 60 second warning. Ooh, there's Foster. Hi, Lisa. Foster, I was so excited to hear you read. <laughs> Thank you. I read my mean lesbian story because I, life is short. <laughs> <laughs> I've been wanting to hear you read for a long time, so that was a pleasure. Thank you. Well, it's such a treat, and thanks for thanks for you know being our our fence, our mule. Always. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got snatched out of my breakout my breakout room. We were having a really lively conversation. <laughs> oh, nice. Well, you can share it with the rest of us soon. Yeah. People want to know where you're hiding the books if you are a mule for the books. It's, oh, it's, uh, my garage. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and where would this garage be? <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the last readings I went to was at your store. Was it? It was great. It was packed. It was packed. I was pressed against a bookcase. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the good ones. Those are the good ones. Well, welcome, to, welcome back, everybody. Kind of that weird, jarring moment of mid-conversation. Just... <laughs>
back in, but welcome. I'm glad to see most of you stuck around for the conversation. We didn't drop most of the audience. That's great. So, um, well, I want to hear a little bit about what you all talked about in your groups. Um, and uh, uh, obviously volunteering is great. Uh, if you don't volunteer, I might just start picking on people. So I will, I will, I will inherit Kate's ability to do that. So, <laughs> um, but uh, just, you know, uh, anybody, anything they want to share, maybe some insight you got on the topic of relief or just, you know, let's just start with the first question. What brings you relief? <laughs> Or do I, have to, uh, I don't want to speak on on like behalf of my group. I just, you know, I just want to say that group one was really clever and we're all very good looking. <laughs> and we had a fabulous <laughs> group one. <laughs> we had a fabulous conversation, um, Elizabeth and Jake and Samson and I, and we talked about um, what we're reading and what we're listening to and what we're watching and how we've been finding relief in like just the pleasure of being um, with, with art and with poetry and with podcasts that's sort of designed to be enjoyable instead of, you know, like, like you watch it for fun or you watch it to escape. And, and uh, we talked about how, how great that experience is. Yes, escapism is very needed at this time. <laughs> Who else? I will pick on people. <laughs> I, I can, I feel like there's a nice segue from what Foster said, like, because we mentioned escapism too, like mentioned Netflix as a, as a sort of, I don't know, a, a, a buoy of escapism. Um, but also um, we sort of talked about connect, like, and this just seems funny in like the time of COVID, but like moments of connection and um, when not only like, coupling like escapism, but also escapism with those moments where um, we do experience connection to other people. Um, even when connection to others now, right now, it can be, you know, really fraught in some ways and, and a little scary, but, um, but yeah, so I feel like I should brag about my group because Foster didn't, that was really cool, but I'm not that cool. You guys are just great. <laughs> it was really awesome talking to you. Brag away, brag away. <laughs> <laughs> Well, who else? I'm honing in. I'm going to pick on first. So, <laughs> all right, Kim. I'm going to pick on Kim, my future sister-in-law. So I'm picking on her now. <laughs> Literally, going to be my sister-in-law two months. So, <laughs> like two months in a week or something like that. <laughs> Not that we're counting. <laughs> um, yeah, we talked four days. Four days. 74 74 74 <laughs> um no we had we had some good discussion and also our group well I was in Sarah's group so um to piggyback a little bit off of what she already added we had the question that we mulled over of when are we going to have relief we felt like coming into 2021 that it's like okay relief is on the way but how are we going to recognize it? And so we were talking a little bit more bigger picture um, in that of just how will we know and when will it happen? <laughs> That's, that is a good question. How yeah. will we know? If and anybody when has will it happen? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and part of the reason we chose this theme, JP and I um, had to do directly with the response to the election, uh, as mentioned at the start, Insight started as a response to the 2016 election. And uh, I know that when the Cates asked us to take over, we realized we were going to have the first meeting after the 20, you know, the 2020 election. And, and we held off on picking a theme because we're like, we need to see what happens because we need to know what if the theme is going to be a rallying cry or a, uh, and so, you know, we immediately had that sense of, uh, but at the same time, we know there's still much more to come and we still haven't reached that level of relief, but um, you know, that's sort of, yeah, uh, sorry, we wanted to take a moment to examine that. And that kind of leads into the second question. Um, you talked a lot, you know, about what, how, what we find, what we bring, what brings us relief, but 
transitioning into kind of reaching out, how do we bring relief to people outside of or inside of the queer community, especially those of us who, you know, this is our community. How do we bring relief is, is uh, I think, just as an important question is how do you find relief? Uh, and I, I'd love to hear some thoughts on that. So speak up, please. <laughs> I'd say something about that one. Uh, I, I I remember when I when I came out, I struggled with it so much. Um, and one of the one of the things that, that frustrated me was at the time was why do I have to straight people don't have to go out and announce to everybody, okay, here's my you know sexual orientation. It's just accepted. And it really was it was really frustrating. On the other side of that, now for nearly 12 years, I look back and think, what a gift, because that sort of process allowed me to very formally sort of leave behind that not being myself and just the awfulness of that and step into to being to, to the real relief of just being able to live freely who I am and I think that that's that's something that experience not sharing it um, and it's something we can we can share with people outside our community as well as inside I guess who who don't have that option and yet still have to um, uh, you know, struggle with not being able to maybe live their authentic self. So I think sharing our experience of that, the relief of being able to be fully our, ourselves is a real gift that we have that I think can bring a lot of relief to people outside our community. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I think, um, to, to jump on what Wayne said, I also think that physically showing up for people when I can, especially my neighbors, has been really, really helpful. Like today was the National Day of Action. So I met, um, I've been really involved in rent strike and, um, you know, stopping evictions here in Portland since I, you know, since we did the since we started the shutdown in, at the end of March, like I've been going to rallies and participating in the Tenant Alliance and, um, you know, handing out flyers, making sure that people have connections to mutual aid and like, it's hard work and it's tiring and just seeing, like you can see the relief on people's faces when you hand them a box of food or when they, you know, are suddenly given something that they needed or connected to a resource that they can use and share and propagate, like that's really empowering. And um, just being able to show up, even if it's in a small way and offer some encouragement to somebody to keep going is really, really powerful. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd like to add to that. Um, I think uh, what a grateful gift that, um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge this um, experience with all of you. And I think I've been very much uh, grateful of the, the group that I was um, um, amongst. And um, I realized that uh, one of the greatest gifts, I think, to the, the, the community in which we belong is not necessarily, you know, the, you know, you celebrate who we are is one thing, but also learning how to embrace again, learning how to welcome love regardless where it comes from. And uh, I know in our group, there was someone who was an ally um, and it profoundly touches me to see that people, regardless of their identity, they, they hear the calling of love and they give it freely. And uh, for me, that is the greatest relief, especially in these times where there's a lot of division and I think it takes vulnerability. Vulnerability is stronger than courage. Yeah, very true. Thank you. Thank you, Sterling. Does anybody else would like, like wow, that was a sentence. Uh, <laughs> would anybody else like to add to that? No? Well, I had uh, set aside 10 minutes to talk. We're about there. So I think what um, we'll just kind of start a little bit of a wrap up here. A um, few announcements. Uh, first, uh, Elisa has been posting all night the direct links to books uh, in, um, uh, in the chat. But uh, for those of you who haven't found out yet or haven't seen yet, we now have, Elisa has 
set up a dedicated page on the other read through site just for in books by insight authors both current ones and past ones so i don't know about you for those of you who come regularly like i this happens to me all the time i come and i don't think to buy a book and then two days later i'm like oh i wanted to get that person's book and then i forget the name of the book or the name of the reader uh and so uh, this is a great way for you to go back and um purchase some books. I purchased a few just the other day and uh, uh, get them sent to you and be able to catch up on some past readers and current readers. Um, and uh, so right off the bat, that's, a, you know, the insight store is what I've been calling it <laughs> since we have that. Uh, and then um, after tonight, everybody who attended is going to get a survey sent to them uh, from Jessica here at Literary Arts. Um, this is a real short thing. Uh, shouldn't take you more than five minutes, but uh, because JP and I are kind of you know, taking over and it is a little bit of a transition point. We've gone through some changes in the last year. We just kind of want to know what everybody's thinking and we want to know, uh, we want some feedback that could help us to shape future events uh, as we go along. So, um, and then our next insight is in March and JP, did you want to say something about that? Did you, the March event or? Yeah. Sure. So our next reading is on March 10th and same same time and we've got four readers lined up uh it's megan albert ajay tripathi and oh, and then uh, nastasia minto uh and daniel gayu so uh, <laughs> and so, so we uh, hope to see you at that march reading yeah absolutely so i think with that i i don't have anything else on my agenda list so <laughs> do you jp i don't <laughs> Except to say well, thank you, everybody, yeah, for being exactly. here. Exactly. So it's one more thanks to all of our readers. Thanks for coming. Yay. <laughs> all right. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs> thank you, Vinny and JP. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you all.